is I was surfing this week through Ecclesiastics, and I just love, in front of you, we just want to sit down and enjoy the Bible. God threw Solomon, King Solomon. God gave, at the time, said he was the most wise man, or the wisest man in the entire earth. That people came from all over the world just to hear him speak. Because that's how wise he was. And God gives us certain people, those who really, really, really seek to know. God asked Solomon, he says, what is it that I can give you? And Solomon, instead of asking for like for riches and, you know, and all that stuff, he asked God for wisdom so that he would be able to take care of of his people, God's people, the Old Testament church. So God not only gave him wisdom, but he blessed him financially too. He made him the most richest king ever in the history also of mankind. And it was mainly because he was, he wanted not the riches, but he wanted wisdom. I was the same way with God. I, I wanted wisdom more than I wanted anything else. I honestly did. I wanted wisdom. I wanted God to explain the scriptures to me in ways that and opened my eyes up to see the things in the scriptures in ways that most people couldn't see it. And then eventually people started becoming aware of the wisdom in Hawaii. Because I stood up, I was called up, and God said, stand up. And I stood up in the Pastor came over there to me, he laid hands on me, then he stepped back and he says, and God started talking to me through him. And the very first thing that came out of his mouth was something that only I knew in my life. Now I'm not going to say that what that was, but what he did start saying that God was going to give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And they would be like jewels that are deep inside your spirit that are and that these jewels would be like nuggets of gold that eventually would rise up inside of me. And people started recognizing in me there was wisdom, which was really nice because God was giving me wisdom to give to others these nuggets, which, was, which is, I would have people come over to my house at 10 o'clock at night. I have as many as seven, eight, ten people be knocking on my door. They'd come walking in since we had we, we were talking about the Bible, and we had questions. So we needed understandings about certain things in the Bible that we just don't understand. He says, can we talk to you? And they would come in there and sit at my dining room table till almost 1 o'clock in the morning, asking me every type of question that they probably could think of in the Bible. And the Holy Spirit would rise up inside of me and give them the answer. So when you read the book, of, when you read... Proverbs, read it. It's, it's one of the most enjoyable books in the Bible to read. Ecclesiastics, one of the most enjoyable books in the Bible to read. And this is the wisdom of God coming through Solomon about our lives today and how these certain Proverbs would apply to us. So, i like to show you a few of them as I was, search, uh, uh, I was surfing through it some of these certain scriptures jump out and spoke to me and they would only speak to me because they will apply to you who are either watching this on Facebook today or going to this week on YouTube. And remember, you can't go to YouTube, type in Swansboro Church of God, look for the Swansboro Church of God symbol and find sermons. And this is for somebody today to hear these proverbs. For example, the person who pleases him, God, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and heaping up that he may give to one who pleases God. Folks, what is he saying here? That a person who pleases God, God will give wisdom and knowledge 
and joy. Do you want joy in your life? I would really like joy in my life. I like that feeling of no matter what's happening in my life, that joy is still there. Because why is joy so important to us? Because the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if Satan can take your joy, he takes your strength. So we can't lose our joy. And the person who pleases God, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. But look, those who don't please God, all of the works that you do, from the minute you get up till you go to bed at night, God takes that from others, those works, and gives it to the one that pleases God. He says, so here's another proverb that you need to really understand. He says, do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are here on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few, he says. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, classic edition. He says, Therefore, let your words be few. When you vow a vow or make a pledge to God, do not put off paying it. For God has no pleasure, he calls it in fools. Those who wittily, witlessly mock him. He says that if you vow a vow to me, God says, and you don't pay it, he says, you're mocking me as God. He says, pay what you vow. And what is he really saying? There's a lot of people who says, God, if you do this for me, if you heal me, I, I, I'll give you 60% of everything I make. There are people who do stuff like that, make vows to God. God, if you can just give me this money to pay this bill this month, I'll make sure I go to church on Wednesday nights. Then he gives you the money to pay your bill that month, but you don't go to church on Wednesday nights. You made a vow to God, but you didn't keep it. But what makes this so much important? This is just important if you make a promise to do something for somebody and you don't do it. He says it's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Why? He says, do not allow your mouth to cause your body to sin. What's a transgression? That's when the body sins. It's a transgression. God was wounded for our transgressions. What are our transgressions? They are sins that we do that are with the body. For example, what's an iniquity? He says he was bruised for our iniquities. He bled eternally for your iniquities. What's your iniquity? Your iniquity is internal inclination to sin, like lust. Like you're lusting at the person to say whether male or female to have sex with them. That is an iniquity. And he was bruised. He bled eternally for that sin. But the transgression would be if you actually carry it out. Now you have sinned with your body. That's a transgression. He was beaten. He was wounded. They stuck thorns on his head. They pierced him with a, a spear. They took their hands and they openly slapped him in the face. They beat him with their, their fists. This is God who treated those people. These people treated God like this. But he took that for the forgiveness of your transgressions. He says that when you vow a vow and you don't pay it, you have transgressed against God. He says, do not say before the messenger, or basically the priest, it was an error or mistake. In other words, God, I really didn't mean it. Or you go to that person and say, I, I, I want to take back this promise I you know, I, I'm not going to keep it, this promise that I made to you. He says, what does it say? Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the works of your hand? Are you catching, folks, are you catching 
everything that God is saying to you. And these Proverbs, these are important in your life. These, if you make a promise to someone and you don't keep that promise, this is an issue now that goes before God's court. That's how serious it is. Amen? Amen. So let's look what Jesus had to say about it. He who is faithful in little, the little things, is faithful also in much. And he who is dishonest and unjust in the little thing is dishonest and unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the case of, and he's talking about unrighteous mammon or money, if you've been unfaithful in money or possessions, God says, who am I that I'm going to entrust you with true riches? And if you have not proved yourself faithful in that which belongs to another man or God, and what's the thing that belongs to God? His tithe, or your tithe. It's actually God's tithe. That belongs to God. And he says, if you're not faithful, which belongs to him, God, this is talking about money now, who will give you that which is your own true riches? This is how important it is to God that you give God to him what is his. But, this also implies how well do you pay your bills? Do you allow your cars, your vehicles, your motorcycles or whatever it is to get repossessed because you don't make your payments on them? You never should have. See, when God says don't make a vow and not pay it, when, when you sign a contract, you have just made a vow when you sign that contract. God sees you signing that contract. He also is very much aware if you don't pay what is according to that contract. This is serious with God. And if it's serious with God, then it needs to be serious with you. See, the Bible says, how about when he says the little thing? If you're not faithful in the little thing, what's the little thing? It can be spiritual disciplines. What are spiritual disciplines? Like getting on your knees and praying to God every day. But I'm going to tell you something even more important. It's being grateful to God every day. Being grateful to God every day. How about reading your Bible? At least sometime during the week. Sometime. I'm not talking about every day. But sometime during the week. In your giving. Are you faithful in your giving? Or do you spend your money on your things for you first? Then you give God whatever's left, if anything. These are things God is talking about here. He says, if you haven't been faithful in the worldly money, how is God going to give you greater things? How about faithful in the way you treat others? Do you curse others? How are you faithful in the way you speak to those that you say you love? Your family members. How about your use of spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts. What God has given you and He expects you to use those spiritual gifts within the ministry. Are you using the gifts that God has given you? Amen. If He's given you the gift and you know you've got a voice to sing and you are not saying, hey, Pastor, can you get me up there? Now, if you don't got a voice to sing, please don't come up here. Don't make us say you're sorry. That is not your gift. You're not, you need to be down there singing. 
He's given you a gift to play an instrument and you know you can play an instrument and you should be up here. Patrick, you need to start practicing that guitar. I did, I did not call it anybody up by name, did I? Oh, that was a slip. Oh, God, forgive me. If you got other gifts, like the gifts of prophecy, and God tells you to give a message, and you hold back because you're afraid to speak in front of people, the gift of leadership or administration, are you using your gifts in the ministry? Because if you're not faithful in the little thing, God says, I'm not going to trust you with anything else. It's the same way in our own personal lives. It's the same thing in your own personal employments. If you're not faithful to do what is required of you, at your, where you work at, you think that boss is going to trust you with a promotion? No. I know what it's like to promote people. I was in charge over thousands of people. Not only in the military, but as the CEO of a merchandising company. I hired and trained managers, and I was supervised over thousands of people at one time. And I decided whether or not they got a pay raise or not. And I guarantee you, if they were faithful in doing their job, they did not get a raise. So this applies not only in your personal lives, but it applies with your relationship with God. If you're not faithful to at least get into the Word of God at least every week, how can you suspect God to use you more in the ministry? But the most important thing, let me read this. I, I saw this and I liked it. Listen, pay attention. Just for something. St. Peter was giving a newly arrived soul, someone that died and went to heaven, a newly arrived soul a tour of heaven. The two of them were walking side by side in a large workroom filled with angels. St. Peter stopped in front of the first section and said, this is the receiving section. Here all the petitions are sent to God in prayer are received. Please pay attention because you're going to need to hear the end of this. The soul that saw the section noticed that they were very busy. The angels were very busy. Because the angels were sorting out all the petitions written on many sheets of paper from all the people of all the world. And so that they could resume their walking until they get to the another section. And this was the packaging and the delivery section. This is where they were taking the blessings and the graces of God and they would pack them up and they would deliver these petitions back out on earth. Very busy section. But then they went to the third section and this soul saw and was surprised that there was only one angel there and he was idle. One angel. In the third section, he was idle. The angel said to the soul, he says, this is the acknowledging section. That's what St. Peter told this soul. This is the acknowledging. He says, the soul says, how is it that no work is being done here? And Peter says, this is the sad thing. That's the sad thing. He says, after people on earth received their blessings that they asked for, very few of them bothered to send their acknowledgments. The soul asked, asked, how does one acknowledge God's blessings? How does one acknowledge God's blessings? This soul asked St. Peter and St. Peter said, simple, just say, thank you, Lord. Are you one of those that get blessings from God? And you don't bother to get down on your face when the blessings come and say, thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Did you pray for something and ask God for something? Whether it be healing or safety for somebody else? Healing for somebody else and they got it? Healing for yourself and they got it? A financial blessing in your own personal life and you got that. God did it. You know it was God. A situation at work that you needed God's intervention and it happened. And then you just kept on, kept on, keeping on. And you didn't bother to get down on your knees and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I get down on my face like almost every single day. And part of my prayer life is, Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I thank Him for the healings that He's performed in my body at different times in my life. I thank Him for the financial blessings that I, I'm walking in. I thank Him for the house that I'm living in. I thank Him for multiplying what I call multiplying the oil here at the Swansboro Church of God. You know what I mean by multiplying the oil? There was a widow woman. She owed a, a fairly large sum of money to a debtor. She didn't have the money to pay him. You know what he was going to do? He was going to take her sons. She had two sons. He was going to take those sons. This is in the Bible, folks. This is in the Bible. The widow woman. He was going to take her sons and sell her sons to pay the debt that she owed. And what happened was her husband was the one that owed the debt. But her husband had died. She was a widow woman now. And left her with this huge debt when he died. She didn't have no means of paying the debt that he left her. So he was going to come and take her two sons and sell them into slavery to pay some of the debt. And God heard, and she wasn't even an Israelite. She wasn't even one of God's Old Testament church. That's what the Israelites were, we're Old Testament church. Who are the Israelites today? The New Testament church. Us, the elect of God. See, God said when he went to heaven, Jesus God, when he went to heaven, he says, there is no more Jew. He says, there's no more Gentile. There's no more black or white. There's no more Korean or Chinese. Do you understand what Jesus was saying? He says, there's no more nationalities. He says, you are one, every single one of us. There's no more really, hardly any male or female. He says, we are one in Him. One in Him. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, Chinese, Korean, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're mixed. He says, it don't matter what you are, whether you're Cuban even. Or even Puerto Rican over there. Or Costa Rica. He says it doesn't matter. I think we even have a Pollock in here. He says it doesn't matter. He says there's only one now. The New Testament church is called the elect of God. So these who claim to be Israelites are Jews in Israel. That's another story for another day. But let me tell you something. 
Are you acknowledging God? Do you acknowledge Him when He answers your prayer? Do you acknowledge Him and say, Thank you, Lord, when Becky drove all the way? Let me tell you, acknowledging God. I've got to say it one more time. This is, this is important. We were leaving the last cruise. We were leaving. Jacob and David were with me in my car. We were following Melissa, Becky, and Kelsey in another car. We had just got back from a seven-day cruise. Jamaica, Mexico, Grand Caymans. We were coming out of Miami, just getting on, just got on Interstate 95 around the Miami area. And this young college girl, late for classes. All the way is five, like four or five lanes, right there in Miami. And she's all the way over here, she's late to class. She decides that she's got to get into this exit right over here. So she decided to cut all the way across. They're all going about 80, between 80 and 90 miles an hour. And I was driving and I watched this young lady come right across and hit Melissa in the front of her car, the front fender of her car area, not the bumper, the fender where the wheel well area is, at 80 to 90 miles an hour. In traffic going 80 to 90 miles an hour. Traffic all around is going that fast. It should have killed my girls. That thing should have spun that car around. And then all other cars would have took their, 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 their shot at it. As it was spinning around going down the interstate. The devil tried to take my girls out. And you know what I watched with my own eyes? I saw the angels of God standing right there and with that car, my daughter's car. When this thing come and hit her right where her tire was, hard enough at 80 miles an hour to spin her around, it like it bounced off of her. Didn't even knock her out of her lane. Most incredible thing I ever saw. Didn't even knock her out of her lane. We finally pulled over. They totaled Melissa's car, by the way. But guess what? That tar car totaled. She drove it from Miami all the way back here home. Another girl. All three girls will tell you that when that car hit them at 80 miles an hour, they said they felt like they were in a bubble. That's what they said it felt like. They were in a bubble. It hit them, and they saw the impact, but they said it was like it bounced off. Like they were in a bubble. Didn't even knock them out of their lane. The only one who can do something like that is God's angels. Their angels that are standing around and protecting them. God saved my three women, my, the three girls in my life that day. And if for me to acknowledge what God did for my babies, for my girls, and for me not to get down on my face and thank Him for His angels, for protecting my girls, How sinful would that have been? How shameful on my part would that have been? How shameful is it on your part? Is that when God has done something so miraculous in your own life, and you know He has, or He even does the little things in your life, and you know He has, but you don't even take the moment to get down on your knees and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
keep going with some more problems. Not many left. I'm felt finished. Couple, ten minutes maybe. He says, remember your creator earnestly now. Earnestly now means really remember right now. Remember your creator. Who is your creator? God Jesus. Who came down to this earth? He said he's the one who created you. He says, remember your creator before the silver cord of life is snapped apart. Or the golden bowl is broken. Or the pitcher is broken at the fountain. Or the wheels is broken at the cistern. Or the whole circulatory system of the blood ceases to function. What is he talking about? When you die. When your body dies. It's what he's saying here. He says, then what happens is the body will, the dust out of which God made, or the earth which God made your body out of, returns to the earth. But what does the Spirit do if you're born again? What does the Spirit do? It goes to God who made it. It doesn't stay. Your spirit doesn't stay in the earth. Now the way international, that doctrine, that theology, and there's a whole bunch of others, like the Jehovah Witnesses, others, listen to me. They don't believe that the spirit goes anywhere when the body dies. How scary is that? How scary is that that you're going, you're going ready to die and you don't even believe that your spirit goes anywhere it stays in the doggone ground. Now to me that's scary. God says right there that the spirit returns to the God who gave it. It doesn't stay in the ground. Like they teach. So when your body goes back to the earth, your spirit will go to God if you're born again. If you're not born again, your spirit's still not going to stay in your body. Your spirit's going to go down to a place called hell. Oh, guess what? Hell, that's just another name for prison. Prison. And Lucifer is your warden. The demons are your cellmates. And his fallen angels are your guards. Guards there to torment you. I think, uh, Tommy, didn't you work in a prison at one time? It's not a very nice place to have to go to this time. Not at all. And I'm going to tell you, some people will tell you they don't, but I knew one of my best friends in life when I was stationed at Fort Leavenworth, he was a guard at the Fort Leavenworth prison. That's what he did, that's what his MOS was. And he would tell me stories of what these guards would do to the inmates and how they would treat these inmates. And I thought, I found it horrific. How like five or six guards would jump on top of one inmate and just beat him down to an inch of his life. And nothing that inmate could do about it. He could whine and complain all day long, but the guard says, I know. We yell boo and he'd run right into a door. Then he did deny it. I'm telling you, you need to know that you know. You need to know that when your body dies, that your spirit. When it comes out of your body, that you've got two angels there, guardian angels, who have been with you from birth, from the moment you come out of the womb of your mother, to the moment your body dies, those two angels have been with you from birth. You know what my first thing is going to be when I see those two angels? When I come out, I'm going to acknowledge them. But I don't even wait. I don't wait. I don't pray to angels. The Bible says don't ever. Pray to angel. Don't let it. If you pray to an angel, the angel's going to get mad at you. He's going to say, "Ah, uh -uh, stop that." He says, "Ah, uh -uh, you only pray to God. You don't ever pray to me." That's what it says in the Bible. Never, never worship or pray to an angel. 
But you know something? You can say thank you. But I pray to them, like, thank you. I know it's what they have done for you, how they protected your life from your birth to the moment you come out of your body. I can't wait to see them face to face and say, hey, thank you for those 20 times that I know that I should have been dead. I know I should have been dead. And every one of them, you saved my life from death. Thank you. I see, I don't get on my knees and, and tell the angels thank you. I can tell the angels thank you after they saved my life. I worship God and tell God thank you and acknowledge God for the angels acknowledging the fact that they did save my life. Do you thank the Lord? Here's my favorite, one of my favorite verses. I'm going to show it to you one more time before I stop. All has been heard. This is your life, folks. But your moment, your birth, to the moment you come out of your body, this is your life. You need to read this verse at least two or three times a week. Go find it and read it at least a couple of times a week. So that way you never forget it. All has been heard. From the moment that you are born to the moment you die, it says fear God. That is to reverence Him, worship Him, knowing that He is your God. Know that He is your God. You need to fear God, not be afraid of Him. He's talking about fearing Him and who He is. Jacob or David, I need one of you to take that off the screen, please. It says, and worship Him. Do you get down on your face? Or you don't have to get down on your face. You can stand right here and hold your hands up in a worshipful manner and say, I love you, Lord, and thank you for creating me, Lord. Thank you for the angels that you have assigned to my life. Thank you, Holy God, for your blessings. Thank you, God, that you hear my prayers, that you answer my prayers, that you acknowledge my assistance here on this earth. Thank you. Do you worship Him? And then the other part, keep His commandments. All has been heard, He says, your entire life. Your entire life. Fear God, worship God, and keep His commandments. And you know why He tells you this is so important? Listen to me. Read it right there. Why He says this is so important. He says this is the full, original purpose of your creation. Did you hear that? He created you. The full, original purpose of your creation is to fear, worship, and keep His commandments. And why? Because this is the option of God's providence. What does providence mean? That's a kind of a big word that we don't hear every day. You know what providence means? God's protection. God's protection in your life, your spouse's wife, your fiance's wife, your girlfriend's life, your children's life, your grandchildren's life, Everybody's life. Protection. This is the root of your character. When you are worshiping, reverencing God, and you're keeping His commandment, it, 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 it develops in you a, a, a particular type of quality. You're not the person who doesn't Oh, it's not faithful in the little things so that you are, so God can't trust you. So that He can't trust you in the more important things. Do you understand what that means, not to be faithful in little things? 
Will you tell somebody you want to do something? It's better, listen to what the Bible says. It's better that you tell somebody that you're not going to do it. And when somebody asks you to do something, and you're not going to do it, it's best about it says just to tell them that you're not going to do it. That, that he says it's best to tell them that than to tell them to make a vow. When you tell somebody something, that's the same as making a vow that you're going to do something and then don't do it. See, I got my two boys that live with me, and I, my God, He knows how. I, every day I'm thankful. I'm on my face, thanking God. Every single day, thank you, Lord, for my two boys. And they're with me. They keep me young. My boys love me. They're here to help me in my life. In these ten days, they're going to be able here to help me. When, this, when, when, when everything goes bad in these last days. But it hurts when one of them tells me they're going to do something. And they don't do it. And it, it ain't that the fact that I can't go, do, I couldn't go down it myself, because I have to go do myself now. It's a hurt that's down in here that hurts me, and, it's, and it hurts down in here because it's a matter of trust. See, not only it's not a matter of the fact that you didn't do it, it hurts deep for you. It cuts deep because it affects the trust that you might have in them, for, for, for them doing something that's much more important to you. And it's the same way with you, with anybody in your own personal family, your own personal workplace, your own personal life. You tell your children you're going to do something by God, you need to do it. Because if you don't do it, it, it there, there's a hurt that comes there's a hurt that comes when we don't fulfill what we say we're going to do. God's the same way. When you tell him you're going to do something and you don't do it, he said, hey, look, it hurts. It hurts. If I do something for somebody and it completely bless them out of their minds almost and they don't even acknowledge that what I've done for them. They don't really tell me thank you for what you've done for me. And I might have given them something in a time of their need. And they don't even acknowledge it. Is it how do you feel? How did Jesus feel? When he healed ten leopards. Only one of them came back to him and said, Thank you for healing me, Master. But you know what Jesus said to him? He said, He acknowledged that one's worship, his, his thank you. But this is the thing he said. He said, Weren't there ten of you? Weren't there ten of you that I healed? The other nine didn't even bother to say, and they were leopards. That a leopard was the same thing as having cancer in those days. You were ostracized. You you weren't allowed to be around any other people but leopards. You weren't even allowed to be out in a crowded place and around be around the crowds. And it was leprosy was a it was a lifetime sentence of basically of death. It wasn't no small thing to become a leopard. And when he healed them, it's like you having cancer and you're dying. You're in stage four cancer and you're dying. And then God heals you completely from stage four cancer and you're completely healed and you don't. And you don't even say, thank you, Lord. And he says, wasn't there a ten of you? 
See, when you don't thank God for even for the little thanks, he says, he's aware of it. He's aware of it. The other part of this, not only is the root of character, notice what it says, it's the foundation of all happiness. If you don't got happiness in your life, do you fear, do you worship, and are you keeping His commandments? Because if you're happy, because I'm happy, you can't even slap the happiness off of me. I am happy. Happiness is different from joy. Because if I'm going through a trial and a persecution in my life, I'm not necessarily real happy about it. But the devil cannot steal that joy that's inside of me. Because if he takes my joy, he takes my peace. I can't let him have my peace. But the devil can take your happiness away for a little while with trials and persecutions and tribulations. But he can't take your joy ever. He can never take your joy. But God says, if you do these three, it's the foundation of your happiness. Also, what is it? One more thing that's important. It's the adjustment of all in harmonious circumstances and conditions under the sun and the duty. Listen, under the sun means your entire life. From the moment you come out of your mother's womb till your body dies and goes back to the earth. He says, it is the adjustment for every uncountable thing, every circumstance, every trial, every anything, persecution that ever comes in your life. This will be the adjustment for those things in your life. You need to read this verse, understand this verse, apply this verse to your life every single week. One more thing, and then we're going to stop. You see what the weight of it is? Because it, there was this bottle of water. Now, a lot of times when a person holds up a bottle of water like this and it's half full, you know, you, you know we want to get to questions like it's a half empty, half full type of thing. That's not what I'm asking you. What is the weight of this bottle? And a lot of you are sitting there thinking, you know, how much, how much does this little bottle weigh, actually? You gotta understand from my perspective, the absolute weight of this bottle doesn't matter at all. What matters is how long do I hold on to it? So listen to me, folks. I've got one little proverb that I'm going to last proverb I'm giving you. So pay attention. This last proverb I'm giving you to a demonstration. If I only hold on to this bottle here for long enough to pick it up and take a drink with it and put it down, it's fairly light. Everybody understand? But if I can't keep hanging on to this bottle and I hang on to this bottle and I don't put it down for a couple of hours, my arm is eventually going to maybe start getting tired, maybe start getting a little achy in my arm. If I continue to hang on to this bottle all day long until I get ready to go to bed tonight, then my arm is liable to start getting some cramps in it, numbness in my arm, even paralyzing in my arm, forcing me to even drop the bottle. So in each one of these cases, the weight of this bottle doesn't change. Listen to me. In each case, the weight 
of it doesn't change. But the longer I hold it, the heavier this bottle feels to me. Are you listening to me? So the actual weight doesn't matter. But the longer I hold it, the heavier it feels. For those of you who ever done some little bit of weightlifting, you know what I call a burnout is. You take that one weight, you start as the heaviest weight that you can lift, and then you keep going down 20 pounds, 20 pounds, and you're down to 20 pounds. And then I'm, I'm pushing, and I'm yelling at you, push it up. 20 pounds. Even a little eight-year-old can push up 20 pounds. And I'm yelling, but you know something? After you've done a burnout, and you've got with that 20 pounds, you can't even lift that 20 pounds. It's just too heavy for you. Too heavy. The weight is too heavy. It's just the same thing with this bottle. It doesn't matter what the weight of it is. It's how long I hold it determines how heavy it is to me. So listen to me, folks. This is important for somebody in here today. Because I only would come up with this demonstration showing you this bottle here and holding this bottle if it wouldn't apply to somebody here today or somebody watching. Your stresses and your worries in life it's very much like this bottle that I'm holding. So listen to me. The amount of stress that you're having in your life right now or the amount of things that you're worrying about right now is very much. Because it matters how long I'm carrying it. See, you think about this, those worries or stresses just for a little bit, and you put it down, those stresses and those worries basically are become nothing to you. But you think about those stresses and worries for a little while, and those stresses and worries are going to begin to ache in your mind. They're going to begin to ache in your body. You keep thinking about those stresses, like me hanging on this bottle of water all day long and not ever putting it down. By the end of tonight, the weight of this bottle is going to cause my arm to cramp make it numb, make me even drop this little small weight. That's what stresses and worries do with you. If you hang on to them all day long, you will feel completely numb and paralyzed. That's what stress and worries will do to you if you hang on to them all day long. It'll make you almost incapable of doing anything else. Because all you can think about, if I'm hanging on to this little bottle all day long, but not at the end of the day, because all I can think about is this little bottle that I'm hanging on to. The weight of it now has become very heavy to me. Not the physical weight, but the weight of me carrying it. So this is important to remember about your stresses and your worries. No matter what happens, No matter what burdens you decide to hang on to. You cannot carry them through the night and into the next day with you. If you feel the weight the next day when you wake up of those stresses and those worries, that means you carry the bottle all day with you. And you never, ever put the bottle down. That's what worries and stresses do to you. If you just pick it up, they hit you, let it go immediately. You don't, it's going to get heavier. You don't, it could paralyze you. The weight of it and just literally paralyze you, make you incapable of doing anything else. Amen? Amen. Come on, I said, that's some good stuff. Amen. Amen. 
All right, Jacob, I need you to come up, and we're going to go ahead and stop everything.